I'm going to show you three integration tricks that your calc teacher just won't teach you. Hey everyone, it's Brian. If you're looking for all the tips, tricks, and lessons to help you get better at math, make sure to subscribe. My first integration trick is a formula for integrating any inverse function. And you can see here it is. The antiderivative of f inverse of x is x times f inverse of x minus capital F, so that would be the antiderivative of the original function, composed with f inverse of x plus c. So this is a little bit of a, a lengthy formula. It might take a little bit of practice to use, but I think you'll find after we do this example, it'll be a lot easier than doing things the long way. Let's look at an example. Let's use this trick to take the antiderivative of arc cosine of x. Now normally this would be kind of an annoying problem to do. You'd have to do something like integration by parts. Uh, you'd have to fool around with uh, some things. It'd be a little bit annoying. But with our formula, we can make it very easy. So first let's identify what the inverse function is and what the original function is. It's fairly straightforward. The inverse function is arc cosine, making the original f regular cosine. Now, in this formula, you'll notice we use a capital F. That's the antiderivative of lowercase f. So we need to know what's the antiderivative of regular cosine. The antiderivative of regular cosine is regular sine. So this is something you should know at this point, taking a regular calculus class. And now we have all the pieces to plug into our formula. So the antiderivative of arc cosine of x following this formula would be x times f inverse of x, so that's arc cosine of x, minus uppercase f, so that's the sine of x, composed with f inverse of x. So it's not times, I have to actually evaluate sine x at our inverse function. I'm going to plug arc cosine inside of sine x plus c. Now this is correct, but it's probably not the answer your professor was going for, so we can make our answer a little bit better using basic trigonometry. We can actually simplify sine of arc cosine of x. If we think of sine of arc cosine of x as x over 1, and if you remember how to do this, we draw a triangle. Since I'm talking about cosine as adjacent over hypotenuse, that means the adjacent side would be x the opposite side would be 1, and I can get the third side by the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In this case, x squared plus this side squared equals 1 squared. If I mess around and solve for that, if I solve for the third leg of that triangle, I'm going to get the square root of 1 minus x squared. And now all I need to look at is what is the sine of this triangle? Well, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so just square root of 1 minus x squared over 1. I'll just replace that in this formula. And there you go. You have the antiderivative of arc cosine with this simple equation. You didn't have to use integration by parts. How great was that? My next trick is for definite integrals, and it's a pretty quick one. It says that the integral from a to b of f of x dx is the same as the integral from a to b of f of a plus b minus x. Now you can show this fairly easily using the definition of the definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And while this trick isn't as powerful as the last, it can be a great time saver. Let me show you what I mean with an example. So here's an example. It's the definite integral from 1 to 3 of 4 minus x quantity cubed. Now, of course, you could do a u substitution to solve this problem. You could also expand this out by doing a bunch of distributing. But if I use this trick, it might save me some time. It might save me some valuable minutes taking an exam. So let's see what I should do. Well, this, this trick says that this should be the same as the definite integral from 1 to 3 of 4 minus, and what do I do? I actually evaluate x. I evaluate this function at a plus b minus x. So instead of x, I'm going to put a plus b minus x. 
Well, you can sort of see what happens here. I've got 4 minus 1 minus 3, or rather 4 minus 4, that would cancel. And then I'd have x minus x is plus x. So this just reduces to the definite integral from 1 to 3 of regular x cubed. And this is a similar result to what you would get if you did a u substitution. It's just much faster. And so now this is an easy thing to compute, right? We just add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, evaluate from 1 to 3. And I think that's just going to be 3 to the 4th over 4 minus 1 fourth, whatever that is. I don't really care. My job is to show you the trick. There's another one for you to use. Now, for those of you that stick around, I like to save the most powerful and amazing trick for last. And this one's pretty crazy. We're going to get into partial derivatives, so I hope you're ready. This says if I've got some integral of a function of two variables, I can actually differentiate under the integral sign with respect to the other variable. So if I've got a definite integral from a to b of a function of two variables, x and y dx, then the derivative of that function of y is the same as taking the partial derivative under the integral sign. This is pretty amazing. It works with the properties of partial derivatives, and it lets us solve things that we probably wouldn't be able to solve before. It's best illustrated by an example. Here I have a pretty nasty definite integral for you to look at. The definite integral from 0 to 1 of x to the fifth minus 1 over natural log x dx. Now just think for a second, how would you do this? Uh, I'm curious as to what you think. Probably none of the normal integration methods you would have learned in Calc 1 or 2 are going to work with this. But if we use differentiation under the integral sign, we can actually come up with a solution. So this is a little bit involved, but stay with me here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to need to define this as a function of two variables. And the tricky part usually with this is figuring out what the other variable should be. Clearly one of these variables is x, but what should the other variable be? Well, in this case, the best choice is the exponent of x. And so what I'm going to do is instead of having a 5, I'm just going to call this y. And I'm going to define this as my f of y, just like we did with the presentation of this trick. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of both sides, differentiation under the integral sign. So we're going to derive with respect to y. So what does this mean? Well, that means f prime of y should be equal to taking the partial derivative underneath the integral sign, which is really, really the trick, the thing that's really motivating this trick. So how do we take partial derivatives? Well, remember, partial derivative, uh, you keep the other variable constant. So if I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to y on both sides, that's what I'm really doing here. That means x is a constant. So x is a constant. Natural log x is a constant. This is really like a constant to a variable power. I'll just remind you, if you're taking the derivative of a constant to a variable power, for example, like the derivative of a to the x, where a is a constant, its derivative is a to the x natural log a. That's the formula from Calc 1. So what's the derivative here? The derivative of x to the y with respect to y is x to the y natural log x. The derivative of 1 is 0 because 1 is still a constant. And we have over ln of x because ln of x was a constant. And so that's how that works. That's the differentiation under the integral sign. Well, would you look at that? Isn't that convenient? We can now have those natural log of x's cancel. And I just have the definite integral from 0 to 1 of x to the y dx. Well now, now I'm integrating with respect to x, which means y is a constant, and I can just treat this like add 1 to the power divided by the new power, just like regular anti-differentiation. So all this is, this is just x to the y plus 1 divided by y plus 1, evaluate from 0 to 1 for x. Well, if I plug in 1, that's great. So I've got this. If I plug in 0, I get 0. Uh, 1 to any power is 1. I might as well just write it like this. And so this is f prime of y. Well, that's not quite what I wanted. Uh, I really wanted capital F of y. So I need to now integrate. I need to take another antiderivative with respect to y. Well, if I antiderive with respect to y of both sides here, what's the antiderivative of 1 over 
y plus 1 with respect to y, well, that's the natural log of the absolute value of y plus 1 plus c, and this is capital F of y. Now, I sort of have to deal with this plus c situation because I don't want a plus c in my final answer, right? We have a definite integral, so we should end up with a number here. To deal with this c, we're just going to plug in 0 um, because if I plug in 0 for y, we'll just get log of 1, which is 0. And so we'll have f of 0 being c. Well, let's think. That just means that we would have had x to the 0, which is 1. So we're actually going to get 0 under the integrand. So that's going to leave c also being 0. Through this differentiation under the integral sign, I found that this definite integral from 0 to 1 of x to the y minus 1 over natural log x dx is equal to the natural log of y plus 1. Hey, I was concerned with this problem which is the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the fifth minus 1 over ln x. Well, that means I just plugged in 5 for y here. I'll just plug in 5 for y here. ln of 6 will be the answer. I challenge you to do that using a different method. So there was a ton of information in this video, especially on that last trick. I know I sped through it, but there's lots of great information there. I encourage you to go back and watch all this again. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like this, let me know in the comments below and make sure to subscribe. You can also support me on my Patreon page, link in the description. And as always, have a great day.